Hello! Welcome to an adventure. <laughs> Today is episode number 29 of Archival Adventures um, here on uh, twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios and twitch.tv slash Rogan27. Um, so I'm Anthony Wright here. <laughs> I can't even say my own name. I'm Anthony Wright Day Hernandez, the Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech. And uh, today's episode, we're going to be continuing with some exploration of home remedies, uh, folk medicine, and patent medicines. A um, couple of acknowledgments to do before we dive into that content. Uh, I want to acknowledge the Tudelo and Monacan people, who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live, and recognize their continuing connection to the land, water, and air that Virginia Tech consumes. I want to pay respect to the Tudelo and Monacan nations um, and to their elders past, present, and emerging. I also want to acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus was previously the site of the Smithfield Plantation. At any point from 1774 to 1865, the Preston family enslaved 40 to 100 African men, women, and children on this land. And I want to pay respect to those souls and acknowledge that Virginia Tech is undeniably tied to this legacy. Further, I want to acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus was previously the site of the Solitude Estate, which enslaved at least 30 African men, women, and children on this land. I want to acknowledge the contributions of the Fraction family and other enslaved persons in the creation and emergence of Virginia Tech as a major land-grant university. So, thank you for uh, waiting during that. Hello, Hannah. Hi, Fluid Ann. Um, I do <laughs> welcome everybody in. Um, at least one of these two channels is currently in sub-only mode. Uh, that is the Rogan27 channel is currently in sub-only mode because there's been some bot activity that has been targeting marginalized streamers. And um, <laughs> I stream on that channel with the LGBTQIA plus and the gay tags, uh, which could potentially make that channel a target. And so I want to keep the community safe. So that one is in sub-only mode. Um, if you do want to participate in chat, you can always hop over to the VTUL Studios um, channel. That is twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios, all one word, um, VTUL as in Virginia Tech University Libraries. Um, and so if you want to join in chat and you're not subscribed to the Rogan27 channel, you can pop over there and I will be monitoring both chats. Um, <laughs> Hi, Lord Portico. <laughs> Looks frustrated about the internet for no reason. <laughs> By no reason, I mean all the reasons. Yeah, um, I just uh, want to make sure that the viewers who come in um, for educational content don't get swamped in uh, bots dropping offensive messages, which is what's been going around on Twitch. So that's why I have instituted that. Um, yeah, and I do see both channels uh, got followed by a bot basically as soon as I went live. So um, <laughs> we'll, we'll see what goes on. Uh, anyway, <laughs> we're looking at, um, uh, what did I say? Folk medicine, essentially. Uh, <laughs> but a lot of like Victorian era, patent medicines, 
uh, recipe books that have medicinal remedies in them. Um, so that is what we're going to be looking at today. And uh, if you saw the tweet, um, I had Burdock's Blood Bitters. Um, and that is the book we're going to start with. So it's in a little sleeve to go on our rare books shelf, but it is this lovely yellow volume. Burdock Blood Bitters. <laughs> Medicine to cure grumpiness. <laughs> called coffee. Um, possibly, quite possibly. So we have burdock blood bitters here. Almanac and Key to Health, Foster, Milburn and Company, Buffalo, New York. Um, and so what you can see on the cover, and I don't know, I can, I can zoom in a little bit and maybe you can see some of, like, my little preview window is really, really tiny. So I don't actually know how much detail you can see in the illustration, but the little girl illustrated here on the cover is holding a box. Um, and the box is labeled Burdock Blood Bitters, The Great Blood Purifier, uh, Renovator and Tonic Mixture. Um, and, of course, holding a key to the year 1888, which would be the year that this almanac is for. So that gives us a date for when these remedies were being sold. And, of course, this is a patent medicine, burdock blood bitters. Um, so it's going to be ads. either had not had enough or had too much coffee. Why not both? <laughs> yeah, Wednesday can do that. Um, let's see. So let's take a look in here. Um, apart from an interesting illustration of uh, intestines um, that I'm not going to focus on too much, let's the Toll Gates of Health. On the best organized and best kept roadways, there are to be found turnpikes or gates through which all travelers must pass if they follow the direct road, the gatekeeper requiring toll of all the passengers to pay for keeping the road in repair. Sometimes people foolishly drive a long way around over rough, bad roads to escape paying toll, while others boldly attempt to run the gate. Both classes usually are made to suffer the consequence. Now the stomach, the liver, the bowels, the kidney, or kidneys, and the skin are the toll gates on the road to health. If we attempt to crowd food in an undigested state through the stomach, if the stomach does not take toll in the shape of proper nourishment, the roadway is soon out of repair. The next gate, the liver, demands toll in the secretion of pure, healthy bile. The bowels demand toll by their absorbent glands, taking up nutri uh, nutriment for the blood. The kidneys demand toll of the blood in turn, and the skin demands toll in the shape of pure blood, or it breaks out in bad humor. If we try to drive the fluids of the body around by some other road, we may pay the penalty by ill health. If we attempt to run the gates of nature or obstruct her outlets, we are sure to suffer. Nature demands the using of her proper passageways, and she requires the due amount of toll every time. We can never cheat nature in her demands. BBB keeps the roadway of health clear in the human body, throws the gates wide open and pays the toll, always getting the right change back. Heed carefully the regulations of the toll gates of health. And of course, BBB there being burdock blood bitters, which is what this, <laughs> what this book is for. Um, also, um, I know there's music playing. I can't hear it today, though, because that didn't work. Uh, our tech setup is transitioning. I've been in front of this lovely green screen wall um, at this table for 
every stream for the past eight months, but this space is about to become much more heavily used as the university opens up for the fall term. Um, and so the streaming setup is being transitioned onto a cart so that it will be mobile. Um, and so some tech stuff being worked on so that potentially I could stream from some other location in the future. Um, and I couldn't hear. You can't hear the music either. It's just very quiet. OK. I'm OK with it being quiet. I, if you want me to turn it up a little bit, I can also try doing that. Um, let me know if that is good, too loud, or still just barely audible. It should just be some piano music in the background. Um, and again, if you are watching on the Rogan27 channel and you are not a subscriber there and wish to participate in chat, if you head over to twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios, um, that is the other channel that this broadcast goes out on, and that one is not currently set to sub only. So I'm really curious about what this whole blood purifier thing is all about. Here we have Burdock Blood Bitters Almanac. May a Happy New Year's blessings free abide with all the friends of BBB. If you require a blood purifier, a regulator for the bowels, the stomach, the liver, or the kidneys, if you need an appetizer, an invigorating tonic, Burdock Blood Bitters is just the medicine you want. BBB is a purely vegetable compound This acts that acts directly and at the same time upon the stomach, bowels, liver, kidneys, and the blood, cleansing, regulating, and strengthening every organ to a healthy action. It is a pure, strong, highly concentrated fluid compound of roots, plants, bark, and berries without a particle of mineral poison or unsafe drug in its composition. Every dose taken is sure to do good. BBB cures dyspepsia, biliousness, constipation, kidney and liver complaint, headache, nervous and general debility, scrofula in its worst form, and all humors and impurities of the blood. So basically, it's a cure-all, um, which is pretty typical of patent medicines that they claim to be cure-alls. A lot of them were bunk. Um, so it's, it claims to cure dyspepsia, which is upset stomach, uh, biliousness. Um, what is biliousness? A term used in the 18th and 19th century perta pertaining to bad digestion, stomach pains, constipation, and excessive flatulence. So then, uh, dyspepsia is indigestion, which we knew, constipation, kidney and liver complaint, Headache, nervous and general debility, scrofula. I know the term, but I don't know what it means. Scrofula is a disease with glandular swellings, probably a form of tuberculosis. Um, so, claiming to cure many, many different things. Uh, oh dear. Also, female complaints and all irregularities of the system caused by bad blood or imperfect action of the stomach, bowels, liver, and kidneys. BBB does not claim to be a cure-all, except that clearly it does, um, but its specific action is upon the organs named, opening, and cleaning all the outlets of the system, the natural channels of health for the escape of worn-out, poisonous matter that when retained corrupts the blood and creates disease. All this BBB does, while at the same time it imparts renewed strength and vigor to the entire body. <laughs> it only claims to be a cure most, possibly a cure some. Yes, yes, Lord Portico. Uh, BBB has the best record of wonderful cures of any medicine ever known and possesses a wider range of power over chronic disease than any other remedy for proof of which read the record of testimonials from parties cured after all hope had been abandoned. 
BBB is sold by all druggists. Beware of bogus imitations of BBB. Get only the original and genuine manufactured by Foster Milburn and Company proprietors, Buffalo, New York. <laughs> wow. Uh, and then we get the testimonials. So, an unmistakable symptom. A new baby had arrived at little Johnny's residence, and the youngster was admitted to take his first look at the little stranger. He surveyed it calmly for a moment, and then looking up, he exclaimed enthusiastically, His face is just the color of Uncle George's! Gosh, but he must be a hard drinker! A Western lecturer had selected for his subject a bad egg. He says he was struck with it some time ago. I don't understand the progression there, but okay. Sunday school teacher. Johnny, does your father live in fear of God? Johnny, yes. Um, I guess so. He never goes out on Sunday. Thought he carries a gun. Thought he carries a gun. I don't understand these testimonials. Like, I, what do they have to do with a, a, something that cures things? Molly, I wish you would be a better little girl said an Austin father to his little daughter. You have no idea how sorry I am that Mama has to scold you all the time. Don't worry about it, Pa, was the reply of the little angel. I'm not one of those sensitive children. Half the time I don't hear what she says. I don't understand what those are doing on that page or how they help to advertise this product. See, we've got dyspepsia and some testimonials, constipation with testimonials, biliousness and liver complaint with testimonials, purify the blood. I don't understand that one. Let, let's see what this one talks about because I don't really understand what a blood purifier is supposed to be. Symptoms. Blotches, boils, eruptions, tumors, abscesses, bad complexion, low vitality, and poor circulation. There is no more frequent pro and pro prolific source of illness than, neglected st than a neglected state of impurity of the blood. This vital fluid makes up the substance of the body as it circulates through every part and every organ. If the blood becomes impure, poisoned or contaminated in any way from constipation, biliousness, or any other cause, some especially weak organ must soon become diseased thereby, or the whole system may suffer in consequence. Pimples, boils, blotches, ulcers, festering sores, scrofulous swellings, abscesses, tumors, blood humors, and rashes, or some serious and perhaps incurable blood disease may result. Yes, uh, apparently they thought cleaning the blood would just take care of everything because clearly if, if you were sick in some way such as constipation, that was going to make your blood poison and cause other problems. Which we, we know is not accurate today, but again, this was 1888, apparently they thought differently scrofula, kidney complaints, and of course this is all with a calendar because it's an almanac, so you get a calendar. Dropsy from disordered kidneys, and this entire book is just an ad for a product. Um, wow, erispalus, er, er, erisipalus. I have no idea what that is. Symptoms, fever, inflamed skin, red shining swellings, eruptions, blotches, scaling of the skin, malignant pustules. Oh my. Um, what does this mean? What is this word? Erysipelas is an infection of the upper layers of skin. Oh, okay. A fiery red rash with raised edges, typically caused by Streptococcus bacteria. 
interesting. It's an actual infection of, of like the outer layers of the skin. I had not seen that term before. Yeah, a, a superficial form of cellulitis as well. Burdock pills, purely vegetable, highly concentrated, dose small, effect sure, never sicken, do not gripe, regulate the liver, regulate the bowels. Do not nauseate the stomach by trying to swallow the sickening monstrosities in the shape of those disgusting and intolerable old-fashioned pills, whose strong, drastic action but purges, irritates, and weakens the stomach and bowels and deranges the system when you can get a pleasant little sugar-coated granule whose effects are pleasant, prompt, and permanent. Burdock pills are composed of the most active and concentrated principles of vegetable medicines that act mildly, yet thoroughly upon the stomach and biliary organs without any reaction or constipation, constipating effects afterwards, a great fault with most or ordinary purgatives. Children and invalids with the most sensitive and delicate stomach can take little burdock pills readily without any ill or de depressing effects. These elegant little sugar-coated grains are designed not only as a perfect and reliable family cathartic and laxative pill, but also to aid burdock blood bitters where the system is very foul or bilious and to prepare the system to in obstinate chronic diseases for the most rapid and thorough work of the bitters being in the form of little grains, highly concentrated and strictly vegetable, they replace the old nauseous bolus and large pills so objectionable to many. Little burdock pills work upon the bowels and liver, carrying off the bad bile and regulating constipation in the most perfect manner. Put up in glass vials they keep in any climate. Price 25 cents per vial or five for one dollar. Not, gasp, pills. No, you want little pills. Little pills coated in sugar. <laughs> Apparently pills were, were not well received by most people. General and nervous stability, headache. Beautiful children to challenge, the, a challenge to the world. Wait, beautiful children are a challenge to the world? Wait, what about breakfast cereal? Was there a mention of breakfast cereal somewhere? I gotta be careful, that page wants to tear. What object can be more attractive than a beautiful child with the rosy glow of health upon its dimpled cheeks with eyes that sparkle with delight? Its plump, well-developed form, that very model of perfect health and vigor, though plain the features, such a child is beautiful to behold, for truly health is beauty, and without health there can be neither beauty, joy, nor comfort. If the face is pale, sallow, and sickly, or the skin shrunken or botched with humor, or the muscles soft and flabby, all natural gift of beauty is lost sight of altogether. Many children that might have developed into perfect health are cut down in infancy by neglect of parents regarding nature's laws. During teething, when the child's system is weak and its blood impure, many dangerous diseases arise in consequence of nursing from an unhealthy mother or being poorly fed or improperly cared for. Cholera infantum, Eru uh, blood humors, eruptions, rickets, scrofula, or some decaying process sets in. When the blood is pure and the system properly nourished, the freshest, clearest complexion and most perfect development of form prevails. Mothers, heed this warning well. Uh. I'm not going to finish reading the entire page, but essentially what this is saying is if you're an adult who's not gorgeously pretty, then your parents did something wrong when you were a child and let you become infected with impure blood. <laughs> 
a little sugar-coated bits sounds like breakfast cereal. That, that is true. It's a very, so this is a very late 19th century like philosophy on things, is that ugly people are ugly because they didn't behave properly. It's their own fault that they suffer from maladies and et cetera. And honestly, that underlies a lot of our social constructs today. But scrofula, a condition in which the bacteria that causes tuberculosis causes symptoms outside the lungs. Thank you, Hannah. It, it was definitely a thing that I had, a term that I had heard, but I was not, I didn't know the definition off the top of my head. Dr. Thomas's electric oil for external and internal use. In all painful diseases such as rheumatism, neuralgia, uh, neuralgia, lumba, sorry, rheumatism, neuralgia, I don't know why that one's hard for me to say. Neuralgia, lumbago, sciatica, cramps, quincy, sore throat, croup, asthma, bronchitis, catarrh, deafness, coughs, colds, tightness and soreness of the chest, uh, pleurisy, pain in the side or back, kidney complaints, burns, scalds, frostbites, frostbites? Sprains, oh, frostbite. I've never seen that written as two words and I was very confused. Sprains, bruises, earache, toothache, and as all manner, and all manner of pain, lameness, or soreness of the flesh. Okay, so basically everything that burdock blood bitters doesn't cure, this claims to. No household is safe without it for sudden attacks of pain or accidental injuries. It conquers pain wherever found allays inflammation and heals all soreness. Remember the word electric, its special trademark, which means selected and electrized. Therefore, do not confound it with any electric oil or other imitation. Dr. Thomas's, sorry, eclectric oil. I mispronounced it. It is eclectric oil, not electric oil. The, the patent is eclectric is a combination of vegetable oils selected and electrized or charged with electricity and its power is magnetic over pain. It is the cheapest medicine ever made. Five drops cover a surface as large as the hand. One dose cures common sore throat. One bottle has cured bronchitis. Fifty cents worth has cured an old standing cough. It possibly cures catarrh, asthma, and croup. 50 cents worth has cured crick in the back and the same quantity lame back of eight years standing. It cures swelled neck and all other tumors, rheumatism, neuralgia, uh, contractions of the muscles, stiff joints, spinal difficulties, and pain and soreness in any part, no matter where it may be, nor from what cause it may arise, it always does you good. 25 cents worth has cured bad cases of chronic and bloody dysentery. One teaspoonful cures colic in 15 minutes. It will cure any case of piles that it is possible to cure. Six or eight applications of are warranted to cure any case of excoriated nipples or inflamed breast. For bruises, if applied often and bound up, there is never the slightest discoloration of the skin. It stops the pain of a burn as soon as applied. Cures frosted feet, boils, warts, corns, and wounds of every description of on man or beast. Be sure to get the genuine Dr. Thomas's Eclectric Oil. Manufactured by Foster Milburn and Company Proprietors, Buffalo, New York. So, I definitely have heard of Foster Milburn and Company. I want to know more. Yeah, apparently they were just a patent, patent medicine company. I 
I wonder why I've heard of them before. Potentially... I feel like maybe something else that I pulled for... for this spot, for this show, um, has to do with the eclectic oil, so maybe that's why I recognize the name. The Old Standard Remedy, Dr. Fowler's Extract of Wild Strawberry. <laughs> Interesting. Extract of Wild Strawberry to cure summer complaints, diarrhea, dysentery, pain in the stomach, seasickness, cholera, cholera morbus, bilious colic, and all bowel complaints of children and adults. We have Hansen's Magic Corn Salve. So a few other products advertised in the back. Presented by Dr. R.B. Foss and Company, Farmington, New Hampshire. Burdock Blood Bitters, Dr. Thomas, Dr. Thomas's Eclectric Oil, Burdock Pills, Dr. Fowl's Extract of Wild Strawberry. Gotta love patent medicines that claim to cure everything, but not be a cure-all. <laughs> oh my. Let's see. Should we look again at the book for receipts, the one that had the snail water in it? We didn't, we didn't get to spend a lot of time on that last week. And it is a really lovely book. Receipt book, 1731. It starts, so receipt in this case is, is what we would call a recipe today. Um, this starts with Pickles and preserves. And boy, does it have a lot of pickles. Um, those are not medicine specifically, but I don't mind looking at them. Let's see. Pickled walnuts. Pickled onions. Cucumbers. We have this lovely inserted, wow. Um, I cannot make out what this says. Orlando G's pirate drink, possibly? I don't know what that says, that word. But it's half sea scurvy grass and half garden scurvy grass. Um, Brooklynone, Brooklynone and water, creases of each six handfuls, Roman, norm, nor, Roman wormwood, six gallons, thank you. Six, I don't, huh, Brooklyn and, and wa water, creases of each six handfuls, Roman wormwood, red sage, and heart's tongue of each four handfuls after they are picked, mashed, and very well dried. Uh, in a clean cloth, take two of raisins of the sun, stoned, then shred them, and the herbs together with half a dozen uh, civil oranges, thin sliced, then put them all into a canvas bag. Uh... 
with some weight in the bag to weigh them down of five or six gallons of middling ale, and after four or five days, begin to drink it. So we have sea scurvy grass, garden scurvy grass, grass uh, Brooklynone, water creases, Roman wormwood, heart's tongue. Um, raisins and civil oranges. I don't know what all of those things are, um, but what better time to find out? Sea scurvy grass. Sea scurvy grass. Let's see, apparently there is scurvy grass, is a plant. Scurvy grass is an herb. Its leaves and flowering parts are used to make medicine. Scurvy grass gets its name from the fact that sailors used to take it to prevent a disease called scurvy. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I do not know the difference between sea scurvy grass and garden scurvy grass, but um, oh, yeah, it's talking about watercress. Watercresis is watercress, um, which is a vegetable. Uh, it's a leafy green, basically. So it looks kind of similar to like parsley or other other similar type of leafy greens. Uh, Brooklynone. Let's see, it's B-R-O-O-K-L-Y-N. I don't know what this one is. Brooklynine, maybe? I have no idea what this herb is, and a quick Google search is not coming up with any suggestions for me. Um, so a mystery herb there, <laughs> and then I know what raisins are. Watercress or yellowcress is an aquatic flowering plant in the cabbage family. Interesting. And then, of course, we also have civil oranges. What is a civil orange? <laughs> Interesting. So Europeans knew oranges based on the small Mediterranean Seville orange. So I think Civil oranges are going to be Seville oranges, the Mediterranean oranges, which would not be the same as what we think of as an orange today. Interesting. <laughs> and that was that that recipe is just like added in, and the spellings are quite different. Um, then the spellings in the rest of the book and then modern spellings, they're, I don't know, kind of older spellings. Um, more pickled cucumbers, to pickle musk melon, French beans, kidney beans, lots of pickles in this place, Spanish mangoes, to pickle Purslin? What is purslin? That's an ingredient I'm not familiar with. You can't find a pl plant called brooklime 
Oh, you can't. Brooklime, a succulent herb that grows. That is most likely what they were referring to then. They spelled it with a Y. And it, um, the way they spelled it, it was Brooklynine. But Brooklime would make sense can be used to reduce urine output. Interesting. What is a per purslen? P-U-R-S-L-E-N. Oh, I'm, I think that this is referring to purslane. which is a leafy green vegetable. Annual succulent. Approximately 40 cultivars are currently grown. Red stems and small green leaves. So apparently you can pickle it. I think this book thinks you can pickle anything because we got pickled mushrooms, pickled turnips, pickled peaches, picker, pickled elder buds, uh, pickled green codlings, green podlings, sorry, pickle ashen keys, to pickle pigeons. Take your pigeons. Uh, and draw your, and take your pigeons and draw them and bone them, uh, then take the flesh of some other pigeons and beat as fine as for Sophage meat, then mix it with um, salt, pepper, spice, and herbs, and a little lemon peel, and little marrow, and two anchovies, and your yolks of four hard eggs. The herbs of uh, the herbs must be. Sorrel, spinach, young beets, with a little thyme and marjoram. Then stuff your pigeons full, then boil them in water and white wine and two ounces or two or three bay leaves with a little salt and the, and the bones. And when they are enough, take them out and let uh, set them to be cold, then put them into this pickle to keep. Oh, apparently purslane leaves taste a little like arugula. Thank you, Hannah. A recipe for pickling pigeons. What are ashen keys? So many ingredients I'm not uh, f familiar with. Yes, I am not looking for a reference to a video game here. Please, uh, Ashen Keys food. Ashen Keys are the unripe winged seed pods of the ash tree. Ah. So when, when they get ripe, they turn brown and they, they're the little seed pods that will break off the tree and like spin down like a propeller to the ground. Um, apparently, if you get them while they're green, you can pickle them. <laughs> I, I don't know why you want to, but apparently you can pickle them. Uh, pickled oysters, and then we've got preserves. 
preserved apricots, preserved cherries. To preserve red or white currants, to preserve white currants, to preserve gooseberries, uh, to keep damsons, to preserve orange, to preserve green plums, and preserve green peas. Let's see. Cakes, biscuits, and er, etc. To make the best cake. <gasps> Take eight pounds of flour, eight pounds of currants, uh, well washed and dried. Um, when you go to make your cake, put your currants in a great dish and set them on coals with almost a pinch of sack to plump them. Uh, let them stand on the fire almost two hours, stirring them continually. Then put your flour in a tray and make a hole in the middle. Take two quarts of ale uh, two quarts of ale yeast, well beaten, half an hour, and as much cream. Uh, let your cream be boiled and shirred while it is cool. Then take your yolk, take the yolks of twenty eggs and the whites, well beaten, beating therein six spoonfuls of flour. Then beat your eggs and yeast together. Set your cream on the fire. Again, uh, when it is sc scalding hot, melt into it gently two pounds of butter, then put in almost half a pint of rose water, then take of, take of your top of it with a porringer? and mingle it with your yeast. No, I don't think that's yeast, but I don't know what word that is. Uh, as much as you think will wet your cake, which will be most of it, uh, then put into your flour three quarters of a pound of Low. I don't know that word. It looks like L-O-F-E, loaf sugar. Um, I, yeah, I don't know that word either. Almost half an ounce of mace, three nutmegs, and a little salt, then Put in your, again, I don't know this word, Y-E-S-T. As, as it is mingled with your flour and mingle it up slightly with your hand or a spoon, it must not be kneaded. You may beat a pound and a half of almonds and mingle this with half a pint of your cream, boiled and strain. Put into your cream two grains of, two grains of milk and as much of amber. I, I'm not sure about milk there. And put it into your cream then bake it in a hoop of paper an hour or more in a very hot oven that has cooled again. I don't know. Apparently it makes the best cake though. Um, the recipe may continue. Nope, no it doesn't. Uncertain. 
But regardless, not a medicine, so I'm not gonna linger too much on it. Uh, Lady Gore's Dutch Biscuits, Lady St. John's Biscuit, to make macaroons, to make cheesecakes, Candy Angelico, make a cake, iron cakes, cherry cakes, orange cakes, quin quince paste, barbecue brisket. Cheese, wait, no, barbecue. Bare bone biscuit, not barbecue brisket. <laughs> um, all right, Let, let's see, let's get past a syllabub. Because we, we are supposed to focus on medicinal things today. Although I would say many of these things have been things that could be used to treat mental health. I certainly know a slice of cake can often improve people's mood. Um, it's not like for long-term mental health, but it can cheer someone. All right, here we are. Surfeit water, snail water, and cinnamon water, which we read last week. And then we get some wines. A recipe to make mead, to make elder wine, to make quince water. Shall we read to make mead? If I can make it out, I feel like I need a loop, like a, <laughs> a jeweler's loop or something, a magnifying glass. I probably need a magnifying glass. I have many of them actually downstairs in the archives. Um, I'm presently on the second floor though in Media Design Studio B in the library. There are no magnifying glasses around me. There's lots of recording equipment, a few guitars, a synthesizer, a sound booth. No magnifying glasses. So I will give it a go though. Uh, take 10 gallons of water Put it in a clean kettle, uh, seven quarts of honey, and a sprig of rosemary, three rays of ginger, 50 cloves, the whites of six eggs. Stir it all together. Set it on your fire with Oh, set it on your fire when the scum begins to rise. Dash in a little cold water. When it has boiled, when it has boiled till your scum is clear, Uh, is clear gone and no more will rise. Take it off, let it stand till it's blood warm. Then put in four lemons, cut rinds off, let it stand till, oh, sorry, four lemons, cut rinds off, and all. Let, uh, let it stand most day and then Put it in a vessel and let it stand six weeks. Put it in bowls. And that is apparently how you make mead. Honey, rosemary, ginger, cloves, egg whites, stirred together and set on top of the fire. Uh, and when it starts to have scum rise to the top, you add a dash of cold water and then you boil it until there's no more scum rising. Let it stand till it's blood warm. Put in four lemons minus the rinds and let it sit most of the day. And then 
put it into a vessel and let it stand for six weeks. And you'll have mead. And it does appear that this page, that the, the last recipe put in by this author into this book is to make quince water. If you're not familiar with quince, they are a fruit. They're, they're a fruit that's much more common in England than they are here in the U.S. Hi, Chandra! <laughs> welcome in, welcome in. It's good to see you. Um, we are taking the cautious approach on the Rogan 27 channel and have it set to sub-only mode, but so far, so good. Um, we are not sub-only on the uh, VTUL Studios channel, so if people do want to chat who are watching, um, you can head over to the VTUL Studios channel if you want to chat um, without being a subscriber on the Rogan 27 one. So uh, that is an option. We're, uh, we looked at a book today, uh, Chandra. We looked at basically a really long ad for Burdock Blood Bitters. Um, and we just read a recipe out of the book that we ended with last week about how to make mead. Um, and turning the page from there, we suddenly have new handwriting, which means new author. Ooh, a recipe for how to wash the hands. <laughs> yeah, the mead, it doesn't sound too difficult. It had some surprising ingredients, so... The honey, honey, rosemary, um, I've already forgotten most of them, like 50 cloves, uh, <laughs> but it didn't seem like a terribly difficult recipe. L literally, mead isn't all that difficult to make if you have the right equipment. Gotcha. This one just required a kettle and a fire. and a vessel to put it in after you're done. But. To wash the hands, boil a quart of new milk and burn it with a pint of aqua vitae. Um, then take off the curd, then pour into the uh, poffset a s pint of, I don't, I'm not confident that that's poffset. I don't know, posset? I don't know. A pint of Rhenish wine, and that will I do not know that word at all, but essentially that's going to make another curd. Take off and then put in the whites of six eggs, well beaten, that will raise another curd, which you must take off and mix the three curds together very well and put them into a uh, put them into a galley pot and pour the puffs it into a bottle scour your hands with the curd and wash them with the puffs it sounds like essentially making a soap, which not surprising, but, but it's instructions on how to wash the hands uh, rather than how to make soap. For the face, take a large piece of camphor, the quality of a goose egg, and break it into so small bells, balls, that may go into a pint bottle which will f which fill with water. When it has stood a month, put a spoonful of it in three spoonfuls of milk and wash with it. Camphor, the quantity of a goose egg, broken into small balls, and fill it with water. So, 
let it stand a month. So camphor water, essentially, is what they're wanting you to wash your face with. Mrs. Gilbert's rec receipt for the soft soap. Still used for skin irritation. Interesting, I did not know that. Uh, take four penny worth of the salt of tartar, two penny worth of honey, and a quarter of a pound of soap mixed together for your use. Uh, salt of tartar, honey, and soap. <laughs> so you have to have soap to start. Uh, so this, I guess, would be to soften the soap then. A remedy for pimples. Take half a quarter of a pound of bitter almonds, blanch uh, stamps. That doesn't seem to make sense. But that is what it says. Blanch, stamp, then them and put them into half a pint of spring water, stir it together, strain it out, then put it, uh, put to it half a pint of the best brandy and a penny worth of the flour of brimstone. Shake it well where you use it, which must, or when you use it, which must be often. So bitter almonds in some spring water, strained and added to a pint of the best brandy and flour of brimstone. It's the smelly part of Vicks, interesting. Oh, camphor? Is that what you're talking about, the camphor? What is flower of brimstone? I have to look that one up. Huh. So flower of brimstone, uh, also called flowers of sulfur, a very fine, bright yellow sulfur powder that is produced by sublimation and de deposition. It is known as Flores sulfurus by apothecaries in older scientific works. Natural sulfur was also known as brimstone, hence the alternative name flower of brimstone, flowers of brimstone. So it's sulfur powder, which might help with pimples, I guess. I don't know. Completely off topic, but I just realized that I could actually taste my green. <gasps> Yay, Hannah! That, um, that is good to hear that you have some taste. Um, I know from other people that I had heard that um, recovery, the sense of taste, uh, came back for some foods faster than for others. But I'm happy that you're able to taste your candy. More about soaps and washing. To make rheumatum, I think that's rheumatum. Either that or it's pumatum. Either way, I'm gonna read it. Take almost a dram of white wax, two drams of spermacete, one ounce of oil of bitter almonds, Slice your wax very thin and put it in a galley pot. Uh, put the pot in a skillet of boiling water so the wax is melted. Put in your spermacete and just stir it together. Then put in the oil of almonds. After that, take it off the fire, out of the skillet, and stir it till it is cold with a bone knife. Then beat it up in rose water 
till it is white. Keep it in water and change your water once a day. We definitely read that one last week. But I feel like I did better today. You've noticed you can taste some things and not others, but you still can't really smell anything. Yeah, um, hopefully it does come back. My guess would be if you can taste some things, it probably will, just from what I've heard from other people um, and their experience of recovery. Let's see, lime water, more cures for red or pimpled faces. Oh, geez. Uh, and then we have a recipe for pickles for beef, ham, or tongue, uh, a rice florindine, a florindine of oranges and apples, to butter chickens. <laughs> so, moved a little bit off of uh, medicinal, a, a carrot pudding, and then something called a tonsil. Boil a dash of cream with a stick of cinnamon, a quartered nutmeg, and large mace. When half cold, mix it with uh, 20 yolks of eggs and 10 whites. Strain it, then put to it four grated biscuits, half a pound of butter, a pint of spinach juice, and a little a little I don't know what this is. A little tonsia sack? And orange flower water. <coughs> Wait, a little Is that a T or an F? No, it's a T. I don't know what that is. Tansia sack or tonsia sack. Uh, and orange flower water, sh uh, sugar, and a little salt. Gather it to a body over your fire and pour it into your disc, being well buttered, uh, when tis baked, turn it on a pie plate, in it squeeze an orange, garnish it with sliced orange, and a little Again, that word, tansic or tonsic, made with a plate cut as you please. It, it's definitely a T because they're Fs. While the F looks identical in form, it has a little line across the center that's just barely there and you have to look for it. And that one does not have that cross line in the center. Um, I'm looking to see if I can figure out what it is. I have no idea what it is. <laughs> So there's a word that's spelled T-A-N-S-I-A. -S it's apparently a name, but I don't see any associations with food. Unless it's tansy is what they're referring to, which is a herbaceous flowering plant. 
No idea. I have no idea what this ingredient is. So that would take some research. Um, and now that I look at it, it's not called a tonsil, it is called a tansil. T-A-N-S-I-L is the name of the dish. And, and search engines really think that I'm looking for the word tonsil. So that one's unique. I don't know what this one is. Um, but apparently nutmeg and mace and cinnamon and cream and eggs, um, some grated biscuits, a pound of butter. So it, it seems like some sort of like dessert type cake uh, with some orange. Anyway, <laughs> some gingerbread, some batter cake. We've definitely moved from medicines into foodstuffs again. So bread pudding. If I had a specific food research he researcher here, um, they might be able to tell me more. Uh, and with, with a little bit of searching, I could probably figure it out, but it, it would take longer. You think it's a tansy? You can find stuff for that. T-A-N-S-I-E. Let me look. So tansy with a Y is a flowering plant, but apple tansy, there's a recipe here for an apple tansy from the Food Network. So yeah, that this recipe is for something called a tansy, T-A-N-S-I-E is what it is. The ingredients are very similar. This one's just apple. The one in the book here is orange. It's now spelled with a Y. The English language is not consistent. It evolves over time. So, well, we have looked through this entire book now, and I think we should look at another one. There's definitely more recipes in here. It's definitely a very interesting book, um, which is why it gets used in a lot of our classes. Let's put that back here and let's see what we have next. I have an item here that's just called, you are lucky, take this home. From 1890. You've also seen it spelled T-A-N-S-E-Y. You are lucky, take this home. Copyright 1890. The Dime Remedy Company, and oh boy, is the writing on this very small. It's like a, maybe a four point font um, for like the copyright information at the bottom. So we'll see how this goes. Also, I am seeing uh, a few more viewers on the Rogan 27 channel. Welcome in everybody. Um, we are in uh, sub-only mode for chat because Twitch has had a lot of really bad um, follow bots, etc., that are targeting any stream that's got any sort of like um, uh, marginalized identities marked in the tags, which m the Rogan27 stream uh, qualifies for that. If you do want to join in the chat and you're not a sub on the Rogan27 channel, um, feel free to hop over to twitch.tv slash VTUL studios. That's VTUL as in Virginia Tech University Libraries. And you can join in the chat over there. It's the same stream, just going out to the two channels at the same time. You are very lucky if you don't need regulating. But if you do, then you're more lucky in receiving this little bit of a book. Dime regulators, only one dime a box. Billonius Jones feels miserable, wonders what does ail him. 
This wee little book is got up expressly to tell you about dime regulators. Lots of people know about them, but perhaps you do not. Dime regulators for the liver. He writes to the doctor to call. We call them dime regulators because they regulate the liver, the stomach, the bowels, and kidneys. Dime intimates the price, one dime a box. Dime regulators, best sugar-coated pills. He's frightened to hear his case is desperate. There's a little story with the little pictures on the right-hand side um, mixed in with the ad that you read along the way. If you are not sought in your ways and unsensible, like Josiah Allen, you will not be prejudiced against these most excellent pills because the price is so small. Dime regulators for the stomach and bowels. He gives up work, meditates on death. Hardly anyone can see how it's possible for us to make the pills just as good and the box just as big for only one dime as everybody else charges 25 cents for. But we do. Yes, and they're nicely sugar-coated too. Dime regulators, best of liver pills. Swears he'd rather die than pay doctor's bills. We save $50,000 a year that other proprietors spend on advertising and commissions and extra profits. That's how we afford these excellent pills so very, very cheap. And 1890, $50,000 would have been a heck of a ton of money. Dime regulators cure constipation. He sees an advertisement of dime regulators. One box, costing but one dime, contains more good honest medicine than many a patent medicine you pay one dollar for. Dime regulators cure biliousness. He reads it through and says, another humbug. If your bowels are sluggish, constipated, and irregular, causing bloating, biliousness, and headache, you will bless the day you try dime regulators. Dime regulators cure headache. Here's that confounded dime regulator advertisement again. One dime a box. Dime regulators move the bowels. Naturally, easily, without pain. No griping, nor fuss, pleasant to take. Dime regulators cure distress after eating. He turns up his nose because they're so cheap. Dime regulators, the great liver medicine. Purely vegetable, one dime a box. Dime regulators cure blood and skin diseases. He sees it again and wonders if, wonders if they are good for anything. Many and many a time a single dose has quickly regulated the system and prevented a long, hard sickness. Every family should keep dime regulators in the home. Dime regulators cure kidney troubles. He asks his wife if she ever heard of dime regulators. When you feel tired all the time and don't know exactly what's the matter, nor exactly what to do, try dime regulators. In a very short time, you will feel like a new being. Dime regulators cure bad complexion. Next time he sees it, thinks perhaps they're worth trying. <laughs> How many times can they repeat dime regulators per page? Quite a few. 
every woman should keep a box of dime regulators for her own use. They are harmless and very efficient. Dime regulators cure female irregularities. He concludes they must be a good thing. Whatever ails you, try dime regulators. True, they are not a cure-all for everything, but they often do cure where more expensive medicine has failed. It costs but a trifle to try them. Dime regulators cure bloating and drowsiness. He hunts for a dime. The enterprising dealer who gives you this little book keeps dime regulators for sale. We will mail a box to any part of the United States on receipt of 15 cents silver or postage stamps. Address, The Dime Remedy Company, New York City. Dime regulators cost but a trifle. Try them! He now recommends dime regulators to everybody he meets. Say thank you and take this queer little book home. Presented by and it's signed W. F. Old, A U or O U L D, agent. <laughs> so that's that's one of the smaller books. Definitely not the smallest book in our collection. I could pull that sometime. We could look at the smallest book. Uh, So this would be, I'm trying to come up with an equivalent today. I feel like this pamphlet or this booklet from 1890 would be the equivalent of a, like a trifold pamphlet or a trifold brochure that your doctor would give you about a medicine that they're potentially going to prescribe you. Um, actually today, I don't even, I don't even know if, doctors give out trifold brochures about medicines anymore. I think they just give you like a sample of medications now. Um, but th that's like the closest equivalent I can come up with as to a modern equivalent to what this little booklet is. It's kind of like a trifold pamphlet. Let's see what else have we got here. Let's go for something slightly less old. Uh, we won't spend a ton of time on this because the old ones are honestly more interesting for our purposes here, but, whoops, I'm hitting the wrong button. I'm zooming in instead of out. One moment. Right, we have clearly not an old book, but we have a book called A Spirited History of a Classic Cure-All with Cocktails, Recipes, and Formulas, Bitters by Brad Thomas Parsons. Um, this is published in 2011, but as we saw, bitters, which we today think of as an ingredient that would go into a cocktail, um, they're a cure-all. They are a patent medicine. They are originally this, what we looked at first, the burdock blood bitters that claimed to cure everything from indigestion to boils on the skin and a swollen neck. Um, and they, this is what they are today, is an ingredient for cocktails. Um, I, like I said, we're not going to spend a ton of time on this, but I thought it would be interesting to look inside quickly. 
exactly. We get a brief history of bitters, a bitters room, a bitters boom, making your own bitters, setting up your bar, bitters hall of fame, and then lots of recipes for cocktails in here, apparently. Um, it's very, very modern imagery here. don't know most of these. The only one I can see that I actually know off the top of my head is Angostura here in the front. I'm clearly not going to read this to you because it is a brief history of bitters and this is a 2011 book. So unlike the things from the 1890s, reading it word for word would not generally be a done thing for broadcast. <laughs> but, um, Bitters and soda. So this is just a, a history of bitters, a whole book on just bitters. Um, I wanted to see if there'd be any interesting graphics that would be informational graphics, and I don't really see them, but <coughs> there's, oh, talking about specific brands. So here we've got Peychaud's uh, P-E-Y-C-H-A-U-D apostrophe S. I do not know the proper pronunciation of that. Uh, apparently it is a name of a Creole immigrant from San, San Domingo, which uh, is now called Haiti. Um, that might inform nominal pronunciation, but I don't know. Um, and then uh, Angostura. Some say that Peshaud's was the first commercial bitters, but in terms of popularity and global ubiquity, the prize goes to the famously yellow-capped Angostura Aromatic Bitters. Apparently made by Johann Gottlieb Benjamin Siegert, a German doctor. Anyway, so bitters. Uh, I do have... What do I have? Ah, yes. Since we started today looking at bitters, and we just saw the modern book on bitters, how about this item? For home use, a book of reference on many subjects relative to the table, published by the proprietors of Angostura Bitters. From 1937, 8th edition, this recipe book containing other helpful and relative general information has been compiled for private personal use, invaluable to the host and hostess. So I'm curious because bitters originally, as we saw in 1888, were still being marketed as a cure-all. I'm curious to see if by 1937 they had just become an ingredient for other things rather than just rather than being advertised as a cure-all. Um, chef's circular of famous recipes containing Angostura by uh, Dr. Siegert's established 1824 brings out the original flavor, gives the ar aromatic fragrance of delicious spices to choice dishes. Appetizers, soups, fish and seafood, gravy, vegetables and salads, desserts, fruits, Cafe Angostura Simple, Cafe Diable, chocolate or cocoa, tea, iced coffee, eggnog, tonic and healthful advantages. Angostura bitters can safely and beneficially be used as a domestic cordial. A lump of sugar dipped in Angostura or fruit juices with a few dashes of Angostura taken before meals have a marked action on the appetite and digestion and encourage good health. That's a very different approach <laughs> than 1888 where uh, burdock blood bitters was claiming that they would cure you of all Ill, uh, ills. Um, <laughs> Every product which was 
first made over a hundred years ago has in some way assisted in the making or marketing of history. The story of Angostura bitters, internationally and colloquially known as Angostura, takes us from the Battle of Waterloo to make interesting connection with General Bolivar, the debonair liberator of South America. This is the way of it. In 1815, following their discharge with honor from the service, after their share at Waterloo against Napoleon I, Dr. Siegert and two or three companions, kindred spirits, were minded to try adventure far further afield and ultimately decided on South America as the place for it. That was in 1820. When Bolivar was leading the revolutionary armies of Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Bolivia, Attracted by the fight for freedom, the adventurers in various capacities threw in their lot with Bolivar, who later appointed Dr. Siegert Surgeon General of the Military Hospital at Guiana. A newcomer to the equatorial region, Dr. Siegert was unusually and professionally conscious of the enervating influence of the climate. He turned for a palliative to nature's resources and made a scientific study of the abundant health-giving herbs and plants of the tropics. Four years' research resulted in his origination in 1824 of a blend of aromatic and tonic bitters, which he then named aromatic bitters. When first circulating his discovery for use by his patients, by his family and his immediate friends, Dr. Siegert little knew how widespread would become his fame. The bitters soon acquired such favor among the public that he was encouraged to devote himself almost entirely to the preparation of his compound. The fact that the initial demand was not created by any form of advertisement, but grew up and spread spontaneously from recommendation is a real proof of the fundamental value of Dr. Siegert's discovery. The bitters were exported for the first time in 1830 when a shipment was weighed when a shipment was made to the British island of Trinidad and to England, and from that date, organized manufacture may be said to have begun. Then it was that the aromatic bitters were renamed Angostura bitters after the town of Angostura, Dr. Siegert's headquarters at the time. It should be mentioned here that the name of the town Angostura was changed in 1846 by the Venezuelan Congress to that of Ciudad Bolivar. In 1875, the firm Dr. J. G. B. Siegert and Hijos, or Hijos, which Dr. Siegert had founded, transferred their operations to Trinidad on account of unse the unsettled politics, punctuated re with revolutions of Venezuela, and established a factory on British territory, having found, as the memorial tablet wall uh, of their factory declares, under the really liberal government of Her Majesty the Queen, the protection they desired. So, also still just started out as a curative, um, which was how bitters were originally marketed. They were, they were a medicine. Uh, but here, by 1937, they give some of the history. They don't linger on its use as a medicine and instead move into mixed drinks and cocktails. Swizzle sticks, lots of cocktail recipes, punches and cups. Popular aperitifs, eggnogs. I wanted to see the little tiny pamphlet mentioned food, and so I was going to see if it ever got to that. But we've got more drinks. Non-alcoholic drinks. It is felt the following recipes will be helpful in extending the choice of non-alcoholic or soft drinks. The arrangement of the ingredients in some and the addition as a flavoring of Angostura bitters in all account in great measure for the added life, bite, and zest. Most of these drinks should be taken through straws, particularly in those cases where ice is present in the liquid. 1937. This book is a book of alcoholic beverages using bitters, and they've got multiple pages of non-alcoholic beverages. I'm here for that. That is amazing. We have a bullseye into a tumbler, put the rind only of one lemon, bruising slightly with mixing spoon, and add one teaspoonful of syrup, one teaspoonful of Angostura bitters, 
three or four pieces of ice, stir and fill up half with cider and half with dry ginger ale, and serve. Egg lemonade, green oasis, a noon shade, a witch's broom. Witch's broom. Into a tumbler, put one tablespoonful of syrup, juice of half a, a lemon, stir well, then add one teaspoonful of Angostura bitters, and pour in quickly a small bottle of soda water. Serve. Introduce items in order given above. So first you put in a tablespoon of syrup, uh, which in this case I would assume is just a plain, like, simple syrup, like sugar water, because it just says syrup. Uh, juice from half a lemon. Stir that. Add a teaspoonful of Angostura bitters. And then a small bottle of soda water that you're supposed to pour in quickly, which would make it fizz up. Which I'm guessing the effect of it fizzing up is supposed to be... There is why they gave it the name of the witch's broom. I don't know. Iced coffee with Angostura. Rocky Mountain Cooler. Beat an egg and pour it into a thin tumbler. And add one teaspoonful of syrup, four dashes of Angostura bitters, juice of one lemon. Fill up with cider, sprinkle nutmeg on top, and serve. We get some wines. whole section on wine. Domestic section. The following pages are devoted to the collation of a series of Angostura uses in the home. Though this side of Angostura bitters has hitherto been comparatively little known, these uses are now being extensively applied, suggesting that upon acquaintance appreciation is duly earned by the distinctive flavor effect of Angostura and by its tonic helpfulness in many homely little ills. Fruit dishes, jellies, and ices. Puddings and sweet dishes. I guess if it would work in a cocktail or a non-alcoholic beverage, then fruit dishes and puddings and such aren't a big stretch for it. I feel like soup going into things like cream of cucumber, cream of mushroom, etc. It might be a little bit of a further afield. Halibut steak, asparagus, marmalades, beverages for invalids, apple water, barley water, grape juice, lemon water, linseed tea, oatmeal water, and to toast water. We have a recipe for toast water. Toast a slice of bread, brown and hard, not burned. Cover with one pint of cold water and soak for about an hour. Strain and add two or three dashes of Angostura bitters. Um, toast water is a thing. There are recipes for it everywhere. I guess it's meant to deliver calories to somebody who can't take solid food. But I'm not certain. Anyway, that's 1937. We looked at 1888 bitters earlier. Now we got some 1937 bitters. So while we're talking about patent medicines and cure-alls, I have a book here called Nostrums and, Quacker Nostrums and Quackery. From, let's see, it says 1912 handwritten in the cover, or in the front here. American Medical Association Press, 1912. Articles on the nostrum evil and quackery reprinted with additions and modifications from the Journal of the American Medical Association. I don't know what to expect from this book. Advertising specialists. Cancer Cures, Consumption Cures, Cures for Drunkenness, Female Weakness, in quotation marks, Cures, Mail Order Medical Concerns, uh, Mechanical Fakes, Medical Institutes, Obesity Cures, Rupture Cures, Asthma Cures, Baby Killers, 
What? Cure-alls. Cough medicines, diabetes cures, diphtheria cures, food tonics, gallstone cures, habit forming nostrums, hair dyes, etc., headache cures, kidney pills, and similar nostrums, laxatives, misbranded drugs and foods. prescription fakes, rheumatism cures, and seasickness cures. And then there's a section called miscellaneous, and the headings for it are the confidence of quacks, the American College of Mechanotherapy, Carnegie University, molding opinion on food preservatives, American and British labels, testimonials, getting a mailing list, Peruna Redivi Redivivus, Carto Qatar No, uh, the independent press, and what the druggist thinks of nostrums. I'm going to just, we'll start with the preface to get a sense of what this book is. In the latter months of 1905, the first of a series of articles appeared in Collier's dealing with what was well named the Great American Fraud that is the nostrum evil and quackery. These articles ran for some months and when completed were reprinted in booklet form by the American Medical Association. Tens of thousands of these books have been sold and there is no question that the wide dissemination of the information contained in the Great American Fraud series has done much to mitigate the worst evils of the patent medicines and quackery. <clears throat> How hard these forces of evil have been hit is indicated by the organized attempt on their part to discredit and bring into disrepute the American Medical Association by means of speciously named leagues organized by those who are now or have in the past been in the patent medicine business ostensibly to preserve what has been miscalled medical freedom. So this book is a compilation of articles talking about essentially medical fakes, uh, fake drugs and the people who peddled them. There's one in here, page 487, that sounds interesting. So this is kind of like almost an encyclopedia of I mean, it's not really an encyclopedia. It's just a, an entire work detailing fake cures. Coca-Cola. And indeed, I did not say Coca-Cola. Coca-Bola. B-O-L-A. The following article by Mr. E.F. Ladd, Food Commissioner of North Dakota appeared in the October 1909 Bulletin of the North Dakota Experiment Station. We have recently had occasion to examine a sample of Coca-Bola, a product labeled as having been produced by Charles L. Mitchell, MD, Philadelphia, and the face label bears the following statement. Each ounce contains 0.71 grams of cocaine a chewing paste of leaves of the coca plant combined with other valuable tonics. The directions for use say coca bola is made in the form of flat cakes or plugs divided into squares and should be used by chewing one of the small squares marked on the plug and swallowing the saliva. They further say it should be used at occasional intervals as needed throughout the day. To get its full effect will be necessary to use several squares, they further say. Although a powerful muscular or nervous tonic, coca bola, has no evil, no evil after effects and hence is far superior to any other stimulant in the materia medica. Now this information given out in the advertising which accompanies each package is, it would seem, intended to give the impression that this product is an entirely harmless one. In other words, that a preparation containing cocaine as an 
active constituent is to be generally recommended for use without any caution as to the harm that may come from forming a habit for cocaine. They further say a small portion chewed occasionally acts as a powerful tonic to the muscular and nervous system, enabling the chewer to perform additional labor and also relieves fatigue and exhaustion without evil after effects. It contains no injurious ingredients and is perfectly harmless. <clears throat> so we might quote from the circular which is sent out by a man who claims to be a physician urging as it were on the people the use of a product of this kind, which, as has clearly been shown, must in the end result in the formation of, a, the, of the cocaine habit, if not in the complete demoralization and degradation of the individual himself. The laws of North Dakota prohibit the sale of any compound or product in the state which contains cocaine in any form. It further prohibits the refilling of a, of a physician's prescription that contains cocaine, and yet a product of this kind, it would seem, from information that has been gathered, is sold directly to the consumer, although it is true the proprietor of the product maintains that it, that it is now sold only to physicians. In a letter under date of August 19, 1909, signed by Charles L. Mitchell, M.D., he says, what little we sell now conforms strictly to the requirements of the United States pure food and drug law and is sold only on special order of physicians and their prescriptions. Under date of September 7, I called the attention of the proprietor to the fact that the laws of this state would not permit the sale of such a preparation in North Dakota. In reply, I received a letter which is self-explanatory as follows. September 13, 1909, E.F. Ladd, North Dakota Agricultural College, Agricultural College, North Dakota. Dear Sir, your favor of September 7th duly received, for which please accept my thanks. Owing to the crank legislation of many states, we have discontinued the manufacture of all coca and cocaine preparations. Any fool druggist of your state who gets or sells an old package of our coca bola does it at his own risk, as necessarily having been put out some time ago, there is no guarantee and we will not protect him. The people are getting a little sense into their heads, however gradually, and they will sometimes, sometime realize that preparations of both coca and cocaine have an honest and legitimate use by the medical profession. Your state law is silly, and on a par with the nine-foot bedsheet laws of Texas and Oklahoma. Of course, your duty is to enforce the law, not to criticize it. I can do that. I am yours very truly, Charles L. Mitchell, M.D. <laughs> Dictated by CLM. A letter of this kind needs no comment, and a product of this kind, in the judgment of the writer, can only be sent out for malicious purposes, and its sale is illegal in North Dakota. We warn the public against either handling the same or using the same if they would avoid the formation of a serious drug habit and one that must result in positive injury to our people. This product put up in the form of a gum would easily take the place for one who had formed the habit for cocaine of tobacco, and it might be made to take the place of chewing gum with young people who would be entirely innocent of the intentional use of any such preparation, not knowing the evil effects that would come from its continued use. In the judgment of the writer, no man who will allow his name to be connected with a scheme of this kind should be permitted to disgrace the profession of medicine by using the title M.D. From the journal AMA, January 1st, 1910. <laughs> hair dye recipes. I watched a video this past week where someone tried a hair dye from the 1800s. I don't think I would try it, though. Uh, if you want hair dye recipes from the... From... I probably have some. I mean, this this whole book is going to be debunking these things, but uh, let's look at some of the older items that I pulled and see if I can find a hair dye recipe. What's this? What's this? Um, in fact, there might have been a hair dye recipe in the book we were looking at earlier, but I don't remember. Let's look at the Hartford, Res Hartford Receipt Book here and see what we've got in it. Um, what is, is this just, yeah, just an envelope. 
the Hartford receipt book. I cannot read the it's very, very, it just says receipts, trade, something, something, I don't know. Did we look at this last week? I can't recall. I don't know the year on this one. Let me look. One moment, please. I think we did look at this one last week. This is 1800 to 1833. But yeah, I, the fact that it came up when I searched, I'm guessing we did look at this one. But let's see if there's a hair dye recipe. Treatment of teeth, I think we looked at. Paint, stains and bruises, consumption, whooping cough, itch, dyspeptic complaints, British herb tobacco, remedy for worms, ulcers of the mouth, tapioca, hemorrhoids, ulcers, Cure for warts, rheumatism. We definitely looked at this book last week, uh, but that doesn't mean that we won't find a hair dye recipe. Receipt for killing rats, rheumatism. It doesn't mean we will find a hair dye recipe. Paints. More paints. Um, hydrophobia. Green fruit in winter. Breakfast rolls. Ground rice pudding. Rice paste. Bath beans. Soaps. White sauce. Cheesecake, two dry cherries, Marlboro cake, cranberry tart. I'm going to put this on a different shelf so I remember that we looked at it already. Uh, making beer, making ale, pickling pork and beef, flour, a rece recipe for flour of brimstone. Uh, Gooseberry vinegar, stone and gravel, pickle cucumbers again, ointment of nitrate of mercury. We read that one. That was uh, that was interesting. Inflamed eyes, bumbleberry, brambleberry wine. Sorry, ointment for the eye. Dinner at and the name has been crossed out. Eye water. Cleaning black clothes. There's a frickin' index? Sorry. There's an index. They wrote an index. Uh. That's amazing. I did not expect that. I'm, I'm sorry, I found that really exciting. I don't see anything for hair dye in here though. <laughs> but there's an index in this res recipe book from the 1830s. I was not expecting one. Um, let's see what else I got. What else, what else do I got? Oh. Call back to the beginning of stream. It's not hair dye. We might have to look for hair dye next week. But we've got Dr. Thomas's electric, electric oil. A trading card. Uh, it was mentioned in the Burdock Blood Bitters book from 1888. Dr. Thomas's electric oil was an oil treated by uh, 
electrication or infusing it with electricity uh, and it was intended for topical or internal treatment to treat any sort of pain. Um, so a few drops on the hands were supposed to completely cure arthritis. Uh, and this is a trade card for Dr. Thomas's electric oil. And on the back of it, we have an ad. Dr. Thomas's electric oil, what it has done, what it will do. It will positively cure toothache in five minutes, earache in two minutes, backache in two hours, Lameness in two days, coughs in 20 minutes, hoarseness in one hour, colds in 24 hours, sore throat in 12 hours, deafness in two days, pain of burn in five minutes, and pain of scald in five minutes. Croup, it will cease in five minutes and positively cure any case when used at the outset. I'm assuming the word cure. Uh, this has been pasted to something in the past, and so um, that word is gone, but I assume it's the word cure. Uh, remember that Dom Dr. Thomas's electric oil is only 50 cents per bottle, and one bottle will go farther than half a dozen of an ordinary medicine. And this uh, card was presented by James Alman, MD, druggist and chemist from Withville, Virginia. Let's see, I have a little plastic sleeve for it to live in. But the sleeves get shiny on camera, so I took it out of the sleeve to show. Oh dear, we have very little time left today and many, many more to look at. So, what we're going to do is what I expected. Uh, we have enough here. We're just going to keep looking at home remedies, folk medicines, and patent medicines for the rest of the month of August. Um, because they're quite interesting. Uh, we're definitely enjoying them. Now we have to search for some hair dye recipes from around the 1800s so that we can see what Hannah is talking about in the chat. Um, but that is, that is going to be the plan. We'll, we're just going to keep going so that we can see the rest of the things that I have pulled for this topic. Uh, so we will plan on doing this the rest of the month of August. And then in September, I think I'm going to look at some early computer history stuff. Uh, we definitely have a collection. It hasn't been processed yet, but I also think it, me being somewhat familiar with the contents of it, because I reviewed it to see if we were going to take the collection at all, um, I feel pretty confident that I can share those materials on air without them being processed and not accidentally share something that shouldn't go on air. Um, so I think that's what we will do sometime at the beginning of September. Um, but yeah, thank you everybody who came by today. Um, it has been a blast looking at more of these um, home remedies and such. I have plenty more to do, plenty more of the handwritten style, plenty more of the actual like advertisements and such. Uh, so we will pick up some more again next week. I'm just going to look and see who we're going to raid today. Um, do, 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 do. And you know, I think you can probably guess who it's going to be. Um, because this is an educational stream. I think we are going to head over to Monterey Aquarium, Monterey Bay Aquarium, where their title today is uh, Scale C, Mount 
Gil Manjaro with the shark cam. So it is the shark cam today. If sharks are an issue for you, thank you for coming by and feel free not to join the raid, but otherwise it'd be lovely if you all join the raid um, and head over with me to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, let me set that up. But I will be back again next week at 2.30 p.m. for more home remedies, folk medicine, and patent medicines. And I hope that you will come and join me either on VTUL Studios or Rogan27 for another Archival Adventures next week, 2.30. See you then.